it's not impossible to change minds. It can take a long time and and a, and and patience, which I'm not great at having patience. As the older I get, the more I want to see things happen faster, um, so I can experience the change. But um, having the respect to meet people where they are and to understand why they might have a hardline anti drug user mentality, or to to give them what the patience. To, to understand where they're coming from and try to meet them where they are and then grow together to a deeper understanding, you know? Yeah. That was Gretchen Bergman, the executive director and co-founder of A New Path, Parents for Addiction Treatment and Healing, a harm reduction-focused nonprofit working to reduce the stigma associated with substance use disorder and advocates for therapeutic rather than punitive drug policies. I'm your host, Martin John, and you're listening to the Recover Yourself podcast, where we discuss topics you'll face while on a journey to recovering yourself. I'm all about expanding the conversations around recovery to include what it is we're recovering to. I'm interested in doing this so everyone has an opportunity to recover themselves. This way, no matter where you are on that journey, there is a place for you here. This conversation with Gretchen is one that was written in the stars. I say that because Gretchen and I happened to meet on a plane going to Virginia while I was listening to Maya Salovitz's book, Undoing Drugs, a book unbeknownst to me at the time that covers Gretchen's journey in some detail. We're here today talking about tough love. Well, really we're talking about true love and how the tough love movement got in the way of that. I want to thank Gretchen and her entire family and team over at A New Path for doing the good work. Without trailblazers like her, I hate to think how many more lives we would have lost because people just assuming that being tough for the sake of being tough was some sort of a good idea. We have to approach everyone with love first, and then if it happens to look tough along the way, well, so be it. Love is complex, and it's not always going to look the same in every situation. We have to understand that and think clearly with an open mind and heart so that we can allow people to be who they are and that will welcome them to recover themselves as they truly are. Gretchen, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that we ran across each other the way we did and um, a lot of my episodes recently have been dealing with uh, harm reduction and your work at A New Path is some of the most interesting things like, and it's right along uh, along lines of what I talk about, because I do believe there were good intentions in the tough love movement, mm -hmm. in this idea of like, look, sometimes love looks tough. Yeah, yeah. And the, the problem I think about that is that as it translated from one person to, to another down the, uh, down the telephone game, what, what happened was love that sometimes could look tough turned into toughness that was like trying to uh, take the place of love. Mm -hmm. And I would love for you to talk to me a bit about tough love and true love, as you like to say. Yeah. Well, you know, it took me many years of, of navigating these the murky waters of addiction with my two sons. I, both of my sons uh, started using drugs, I guess, at 13. Um, which led them both down their separate paths. I guess they weren't using together in, in, in those early years, but to heroin addiction and, and uh, for decades, uh, both of them struggled with that. And one was involved in the criminal justice system. He had been arrested for possession of a pot um, uh, at 20 years old, which started him cycling in and out of uh, jail then prison etc all for nonviolent drug offenses and um and relapse right uh, uh dirty tests and, and that kind of thing so that's what started my work was um that i felt very strongly that 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 we needed therapeutic uh justice rather than punitive um treating people like criminals because they have a, a drug problem with, which ended up being worsened and exacerbated by the criminal justice system was was what we needed to do and that parents needed to speak out uh, parents were sort of being blamed like we are you know we are enabling we are creating this problem we're encouraging the problem etc so there was a lot of blame and shame going on with the families um, and and I recognize that you know I'm not a perfect parent but I loved being a mother I took it very seriously and I and I I, I, I adored of all the roles I, I've had in my life, and, and I've had several, I, 
uh, that I've enjoyed. Uh, the motherhood just fit for me. I mean, I was very organic. I nursed my children. I had the natural childbirth, all that kind of thing, which is kind of ironic considering and <laughs> the drug issues later. Um, but but I, so I, as a parent, you are willing to do anything, anything to save the life of your child, and you watched your 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 child go down this path and 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 sort of giving up on all their potential and having their lives. Um, you know the future is diminished so and, and even their health diminished that that you know you're, you you do what the authorities tell you to do right you try anything and I tried tough love but for me it just made things worse you know when I um, uh, when I kicked my son out out he went to his father who was uh, an active alcoholic uh, it, you know that it just kind of worsened the situation and and um but I, but I would, but I, but I tried, it and then I realized the authorities, even the healthcare professionals, professionals, well intentioned as they may be, didn't, didn't understand addiction. Addiction is a very thorny issue, and they're not easy answers, and one size does not fit all. So, so in giving parents sort of this permission to be tough and to shut the door on them and stuff, um, it ended up really backfiring. I, I, I think. A lot of parents that I know who have lost their child to an overdose um, are, are very sorry that they did the tough love thing. And and for me, I realized that I, um, I you know, we know that there's a fine line between helping and hurting, right? But um, but I think people took that tough love as being this kind of hard, hard-ass approach to things. And, um, you know, yes, kick them, kick them out. And, and well, I can't sleep at night knowing that my child is out there and could be, uh, you know, overdosing in the curb or whatever. So, the, the, so what we do now with our true love, not tough love, is encourage parents to to understand that they have rights too, and that everybody has to deal with this really excruciatingly painful journey um, in the best way they can for not just their child but also for themselves. And, and for me, that means taking back my intrinsic right as a mother to nurture and protect, right? Mm -hmm. So I, so for, uh, for me, when they were active in their addiction, if they called out and said, I need to come by and stay there, I don't have a place to stay, I would say, come on by, but you know in the morning we'll have the conversation about where you can get help and how you will get help. It wasn't an, totally open-ended. I always paid for their insurance because I knew they would need it when they, you know. So, so everybody, every parent can can determine what's best for their situation. You know, it, I didn't experience any of the violence. Of course, there was stealing because people uh, steal to get the drugs they feel they need to survive the next day. Um, so I wouldn't have accepted uh, of any physical abuse. And I know that's, that that happens for some parents. So again, it's it's just uh, it's talk, it's about respect for the parent. That's about their reality and their relationship with their child, their offspring. And I keep saying child. My kids are in their forties. One just turned fifty. So, I, but but they're my child forever, right? For yes. life, you know. Um, so uh, so the, the true love, not tough love, is is uh, it, it's it's. A whole concept of harm reduction. Tough love was not based on uh, what co tough love is really codependency, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that whole codependent thing that was books and books were written about it, but it wasn't based on science or fact. It was an easy answer, I, I believe. So now we're debunking that whole theory, uh, and we're we're embracing more harm reduction. Um, Health care approaches, not criminal justice approaches to, to yeah, substance yeah. use disorders. Um, embracing many pathways to recovery. Um, embracing harm reduction, including uh, a lot of moms across the United States giving out Narcan to quickly mm. reverse an accidental opioid overdose. Um, and, and, and the list goes, I can tell you more about that particular campaign, but that's the genesis of it, and it came from not just 
my experience as a mother, but but many of the other mothers in our Moms United to End the War on Drugs movement. Right. And there's so much that touches me. One, your kids started using the same time I did. Um, <laughs> and um, like I had a rush of just care when you said I keep insurance for them, right? Like, like how much harm are you reducing just by doing that? Right. Just by being like, no, you're safe. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. okay. You don't have to avoid the hospital when you need it, right? Because you don't know what, where they're going to be and when they're going to need that. And that's something that means so much to an individual to be cared for in that way. And when, and you also mentioned respect. And this is something that I keep coming back to. And, and the only reason that, that I'm alive today is because one person showed me respect when I was 19. And it took me six years from that moment to decide to finally get sober. But it was that one bit of respect that mm -hmm. I finally received that um that that started me on a path to recovery when i didn't even know it was there yet but it was it was that moment and so you know so often uh, the tough love movement moved into um actually encouraging people to uh, put their children in the hands of the criminal justice system um and i know and i believe you have experienced that can you can you talk about like why that's so bad? <laughs> like, I mean, maybe it's obvious, but I would love for people to just hear it um, about like what the the depths of the problems there are. Yeah, well, you know, for for me, my my first son uh, was uh, arrested at twenty uh, again for for possession of marijuana, and at that moment he was labeled a criminal, right? So um, labels are really are really tough. They're real. They're a real thing. So, so although he was experimenting like everybody else was experimenting, he was the one that got sucked into addictive uh, problems and made mm -hmm. and definitely exacerbated by a criminal justice approach to it. So, um, it, the experience of having a felony on your record. Well, let me take, go back for a second, please. People also need to uh, to have community, and if you are, if you if if the system has determined you to be uh, a criminal, um, then then you you make friends with you know, and, there, and of course there's so many wonderful people behind bars with the same experience of the, you know why they why are we incarcerating these people to begin with? We really need to look about at that, but um, th then you, he starts identifying. As it, even when he gets out, he's an ex-convict. This is who he is because you need to have an identity. You need to have a community, right? Um, and so, he, he um, when he got sober, and it's, it's tough, as you know, it's a really tough thing to 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 find and sustain recovery. It's it's, yeah. it's an amazing process to watch. It's it, it's miraculous to me, and I have so much respect for people who can who can do this. But it took him longer to stop seeing himself as an ex-convict that didn't deserve a life, right? right? And it did for him to find and sustain sobriety. So um, so we have been handling a, a health issue as a criminal justice issue for far too long. Uh, you know all about the criminal in, industrial complex and how much money and power is there and the reasons why our prisons are exploding, um, etc. Et, et, et um, but there's also a healthcare industrial complex that, that can, can mess with things too, you know. So um, I, I know so many parents, including myself, who, who, who you know, you would, you would mortgage your home, you do whatever you possibly could to get uh, people in the treatment instead of finding them incarcerated. And and I know mothers who would uh, call the police on their ch child thinking that they were going to get some kind of help and instead they were whisked away and, and locked up um, and not receiving any of the treatments uh, and services and compassion and uh, that they that they really need at that point, um, and anyway, it's a very it's a very thorny issue. But I, I can't say enough how 
detrimental it is to 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 treat this as a criminal justice issue it, and it goes on for years and i can even see sometimes little uh, throwbacks to or my sons and their feelings about themselves based on the fact that they were labeled bad people because they had a drug problem. Can you tell me what it's like for you to have a child labeled as such? So I rejected the label. I'm a really stubborn cuss. Good. <laughs> after, after really searching my soul, and what, did, what did I do wrong? What did they, and even asking my son behind bars, did, did I do anything? to? And he looked at me like, I, this really is nothing about you. I know I was loved. I, I knew my dad loved me. I, I was lucky. This, this, is, this is not you. And so I always tell parents, even though it feels like, Oh, what did I do wrong? Why are they doing this to me? Uh, they are not doing this to me. They are doing it to themselves, and they can't help themselves. And they don't. They don't wake up one morning and say, "Hey, I'm going to destroy my life, and I'm going to destroy my my all my relationships with my family and friends and my future." It, it doesn't work that way. And once you understand and you take yourself out of it, then then you can really reject the the. Uh, the stigma and shame that is thrown at parents and that you give yourself because you, you know, if, if anybody is struggling, you, you, you do a lot of introspection. What, what did I, what could I have done better? What I, you know, uh, um, but, but you can, you can do that, but you can also let go of it because it really isn't, it isn't about you. Um, it, it's, uh, and your love and your compassion and your tolerance and your ongoing support is what they come home to when they figure out how to find their way right there's, there's so much here about like being able to show up somewhere and feel like you are loved because in the middle of that from my experience you do not feel loved now when we talk about tough love if you turn and, and go home and then you're parents call the police on you well you're not feeling loved <laughs> no. I mean, even when you do it when you they come home and you've staged an intervention they're, they're not really loved. right what how did harm reduction or how do you see harm reduction because you're still in the in, working in in these things how do you see harm reduction not only harming the children but harming the parents and families of the people. How, where is this harm showing up and how is that being exacerbated by, um, and of course, maybe there are people like, I can't, I, I don't, I'm not even going to venture to, to guess a number on like how many people actually do well under those circumstances. Um, but, but I'd love to, uh, to hear like, what are the ramifications of a, like staunch, tough love approach? Well, I, I think there's nothing more harmful in society than, than isolation and rejection. Uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that cuts you to your soul when you, when you do that. And, and when you're in the midst of your disease, I, you know, I know that you're already feeling pretty bad about yourself, no matter what you're saying or uh, how you're posturing, right. you're feeling like shit and that you don't deserve. And so when the family is basically saying you don't deserve as well, you know, one of my most difficult periods was when uh, we were at larger family gatherings where my son wasn't there because the rest of the family was uncomfortable and i had to educate them first you know i mean it really hurt uh, in fact i'll tell you a really painful part of this and i have to really go back many years but my older sister is like a twin to me we're really close and she lost her son in a ski accident when he was 17. and um and directly following that my son started having all of his issues and and everybody was angry at him and didn't want to be around him if he was using and then um, that kind of thing and didn't even talk about it uh and then these this followed into the years when he was in in, in jail now i'm at a family gathering thinking uh should i be here or should i be visiting him or where where do i belong and and i remember one day being so upset and i think it was a thanksgiving dinner 
But I left and I came back and I said, you know, uh, my, my dead nephew is in this room. We talk about him. We, we love him. He's always in the room. But my son is not spoken about as if he's a ghost and he, you know, doesn't deserve to be here. And those kinds of experiences really twisted my way of thinking about him. And I thought, you know, I need to educate my family uh, first uh, uh, about the true nature of addiction and what's really going on here. Um, so, you know, that kind of a visceral response to your, your, your question, but it helped me along the road to um, the, the education and, and the advocacy and the stigma busting can start at the base level of your family. Uh, my husband's a, a, a retired psychiatrist. He was still promoting the tough love kind of thing. And I, you know, I, I finally, we got, we got through. Uh, he has a daughter. It takes, it takes a while. <laughs> it takes a while because he, he learned it this way, right? right. And, and that's what, um, and he has a daughters with mental illness and just having those conversations about what is the difference you know, you have a severely depressed child. You're worried all the time that you're going to lose this child. I have a severely addicted child. I'm worried all the time that I'm going to lose this child. What is really the difference? And 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 through the years, we came to the same point of view with this. But you know, misinformation, as we well know in these days, is you know it can be very crippling and it can be very hard to 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 tease away uh, to the core of the issue so that we can shine the light on the truth of it, right? Right, and, and you know, I was talking the other day about um, harm reduction in your daily life, right? You are doing harm reduction at a grand level. Most people are going to need to deal with harm reduction um, on where the rubber meets the road, kind of just like daily life. And I was definitely, I was, I was talking about the idea that, like, when you see a homeless person, look them in the eye. Like, respect goes so far. And by just looking away, and I'm getting emotional, but just by looking away, you are telling them they don't belong. You are telling them, and I don't care if you give them any money, but, just like, looking right them. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. And, and, you know, the moral... When we first started doing the work on harm reduction, it was all about needle exchange, the, the clean the syringe exchange, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I have to tell you, I was the mom that was like, oh, let's just stop this. Let's, let's call the cops on the drug dealer until you realize that could just as well be your own child because it goes back and forth. Um, but I, it was a real education. I used to hide needles I'd buy. I'd throw them away. Well, now... I give them out, you know, yeah. if I'm Narcan, I give them, to, because it, from, I had to educate myself first, right? I, as a parent, I felt I needed to learn everything I possibly could about what my sons were struggling with. Um, so, so it took a while to do, to, to go from hiding needles to giving clean needles to talking about if you're, don't use, don't use, don't use, but if you do, leave the door open, I don't want you to die. And right. I, you know, don't don't lock the doors, so I have to break it down if I'm worried that you're you're overdosing. It, it but it makes so much sense because because if a person's got to know that again that there's a family that embraces the men of the community that that there's a future there for them that they haven't that there are second, third, fourth, fifth chances. I don't care. Right. You know, it's whatever it takes. To, um, to, 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 to find your way back, and, and you don't want to create more obstacles. Jesus, there's enough obstacles already, you know, in the way. And, and they're using because obstacles have appeared already. And it's, mm -hmm. it has, like, the drug, you know, like, I like to say, like, the system is diseased, not the people, you know, like, the way that we've put people through the system that's a like that's not that that hasn't been healthy for a long time. Now, every child is going to go through their individual like and need their own individual sort of program that a parent is going to have to go through. Now, you went through two you had two children in which you wanted to help. So, I'm sure both of them were different in different ways. Um and Every parent has to understand that 
that's going to be the case. And how do they navigate that? Or how do they, how do they even start to imagine navigating that when they start to see like, oh, this has happened. Yeah. Well, first they came to their addiction in two very different ways to begin with. When my older son started using you, you, you knew right away. I mean, there's something really wrong. He gave up all his dreams of being a sportscaster and a tennis star and all that kind of stuff. I mean, things really changed fast. Yeah. And, and so, but my younger son, I think he was thinking, well, I'm not, I'm going to show that I, I can use and not become addicted, you know? And, and so he, he did graduate high school and went on to college and, and while using, and I, you call me a codependent, but I, I knew he was, and I went ahead and sent him to the sound engineering school because I wanted him to have an occupation to fall back on when he when he found his way, right? right. So um, yes, they're very they're different personalities, different different way, uh, different recoveries. One found his recovery through met, uh, methadone maintenance. One um, tried everything else, but found then that. The, at the end, uh, the the abstinence and the and the twelve step programs, uh, and I would say it's not the twelve step programs as much as it's the community. Now, finally, we have a robust recovery community. Stigma is still there, but it's not to the level that it was twenty years ago. Um, and more options for recovery, more acceptance, more understanding, more intelligence uh, about it. So. Um, it, it, they're both very different. I, I'll tell you that my my younger son, and this is where everybody was telling me to give up on him, and and I was starting to think that I needed to start planning, you know, a funeral. Um, uh, to be blunt about it, um, he, he was a, he, he had been using uh, uh, needles for so long. He had uh, a, you know physical uh, problems that went along with with with, with that. So, um, but I continued to put him in programs. <laughs> And so he was in 19 treatment programs. Uh, that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I was giving a talk there. He was giving a talk with me, and I said, I think he was in 14 treatment. And he says, uh, no, if you count the ones I walked right out of, <laughs> it was 19. And, but, and people say, well, well, how do you feel about that, all that money, all that? And I say, fine. I feel fine about it because I, I believe that each each time he had a respite from using and each time he was introduced to a new tool uh he put that together it, it's like a jigsaw puzzle one piece at a time and and so he just needed more different tools in his toolbox and to finally find his way and the strength to um you know to do it and, and of course he, you did it yourself he did it himself but 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 still the environment and the support system around it do play a part in it you know and um and he found and encouraged the right support system that's last time um yeah, yeah. it's a it's a huge process for the individual and the tough love model um that you know in which toughness comes before the loveness <laughs> is is yeah. is really is really a uh, is is really backwards and they have us in that model they there there is a there is a premise that if it's not tough it's not love and um that although how have you seen in your true love approach and the true love model that you talk about Outwardly, sometimes things can look tough. Mm -hmm. what, what is the difference between when an action is being done that looks tough but is supported with a loving heart? Because I know this. But is there a way for you to express this? <laughs> like, I don't even know. Um, you know, like, like there is... Like, I know when I talk to people with an open heart and loving, I can never offend them. Right. You, you can tell the truth without offending because you're coming from that compassionate um, position. Um, well, first off, the word tough and love to me will never resonate. It just it doesn't work. But there is such a thing as abiding 
um, even disciplinary love. It, it, when you know, and I, I'm talking about when your child is a child, not necessarily mm -hmm. adult, because there has to be some respect for them as an adult uh, following their own journey uh, later on. But um, so when when we say true love, I and mean, we we work so hard to find the the verbiage. Yeah. Is it real love? Is it you know? And how do you say this versus uh, the love between a man and a woman or a, a partner? You know, but 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 you know, ongoing abiding love for a child does not mean that you're loosey goosey and will bend over backwards and let them just run all over you, right? right. It's, it, it's, it, it does have some um, guideposts to it. It does have some a framework to it, you know, but, but again, back to the respect for other people, I truly believe you have to, you have to figure out what those goalposts are with those, uh, yourself. You know, I can't tell you, but I, what I can tell you to do is to to give yourself back, your, to empower yourself as a parent, to go back to your natural, intrinsic nature as a mother, as a nurse, you know, um, to, 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 to find the answers that work for you and your child. Um, so I think in a way, the tough love approach, kind of, if you believe that as parent, if I do tough love, they will do this, it's giving you too much power. You don't have that kind of power to wield, you know. So, so it's it's um, it, it, it's at the same time saying I can't make you be anything, mm -hmm. but I can help you, guide you, shepherd you, um, always be there for you, unconditionally love you. Um, uh, and so, and, uh, so you can find your way. And that doesn't mean I'm going to be a victim to you either. And that exactly. Thank you for saying that. Because, and that's part of the reason I, I, I rejected some of the. I love, I loved a, a lot of. The, I love the serenity prayers. Put it that way. I just love that. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 yes, accepting the having the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Cannot change the fact of my son's addiction. But the second part, courage to change the things you can, it, you know, was where I started my organization 22 years ago, was that I, I felt there were things that we could do, changing laws, changing perceptions, uh, stigma busting, all those things that we, we as parents um, should be leading that charge. Yeah. We are the ones with lived experience, and we we love and understand our children. You know, right. I, we're there on the on on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the others. Uh, hopefully, you have the wisdom to know the difference, which is what we navigate every every day of our lives, right? You know, that's that, that's a part of my journey. But again, I I came to this step by step. It, it, it's not like I, ha I suddenly went, oh, I'm going to go from here to yeah. over here. It was it was a gradual process, and as long as you keep checking with yourself, you know, are am I again? It's that fine line, that that tightrope that we know, because our children have a life threatening disorder. That's the truth, and so nobody probably on the planet loves your child as much as you do. Right? So if you really care about their futures you should have some say in the way that society handles this. So I talk a lot about this concept of recovering to something, right? Like, like there's a recovering from, I get that. We, we have that. That's, that's out there in many, many different flavors. Um, and I talk about like this, this step of like recovering to. And so once you have like, once you start not, no longer living under the influence of something, you're thinking clearly. And you can now think about a future. You know, when, when I was using, I had no future. Like, that's why I, I did what I did. So, so that is a place that we can kind of grow towards. Mm -hmm. The thing is, the interesting thing about recovering too is that we're all living under the influence of a number of things. Like you mentioned, parents are like, I can't control the fact that you use. And I can't control, you know, I like... When I got my cat, this is going to be, I don't have children, 
when I got my cat, I saw one cat. It fit the description. Like I was like, I need to not be allergic to it. <laughs> and mm. it needs to be under eight months. I found those two in my first cat. I said, okay, you want to see another one? I was like, no, it's all a crap shoot. Like, it's just what it is. Like this cat and me, like she fits the bill and I'm going to take it home. And I kind of feel the same way about like children. It's just like, hey, this is the one. And so we're going home with it. You don't get to choose that. Like it's just, yeah. and, and, and there is to be in a space where it's like, I am going to respect you as a human being and you are not my property. You're not something that is going to reflect me. You are you, and I am here to shepherd you into the world, you know? And and um, I dated a woman who was kicked out of her house at 17 because of her beliefs. Her, her, her parents were, you know, staunchly religious, and um, and she was still religious as well, but but her actions didn't, you know, they were, they were in, in line with addiction and other things like that. So, but that... That was that tough love. And and I was so glad that I was there because I was in recovery already and I was like able to like show her some respect, you yeah. know. But as a parent, her parents needed to recover as well. And they needed to be able to see beyond what they thought they wanted and understand that this is a crapshoot. <laughs> like, like yeah. I don't know who you, who's coming up, but like I'm, this is mine to, to deal with. And so I just wanted to kind of bring those stories into the mix and see like, how does, how did those like experiences like resonate with you or, or how do you, how do you see those? I have a friend who was uh, told, uh, and she, and she's a clinician as well. Uh, and her, she was told when her son was 16, that she needed to kick him out, and, and, and you go, okay, but what about the authorities? Isn't that child you know, <laughs> endangerment or whatever? Right. So, so she instead put a tent in her backyard and, and, and let him sleep in a tent. But I, now she thinks back and she thinks, how could I have put my son in a tent in the backyard? Like, I mean, how, 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 what a rejection. What a, yeah, you know, eh. but, um, but at the time, but, but now she's still struggling with with, with her, the same son, and and but now of course he's it, it, uh, four years old and has to put the same restrictions. Can he's come back many times? Uh, can't can't deal with the police knocking on the door and 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 all the chaos it goes along with it. And one has to respect that. You know, again, it, it, you you respect not only the person that's going through this, but the person who's who, the, around the, the circle of, of, of family members that, that, that are also dealing with that. And so, um, you know, now she says, oh, I'm doing tough love. Well, she's not really. I mean, he, she, he comes by and gets clean clothes and, he, and, and she keeps in touch with him and things like that. Um, uh, but it's, it, it's a real journey. I, I don't know how to, exactly to respond to you, but all the stories are so so varied and and once again you just do what you can do but you have to protect yourself as well and yeah. and you don't you don't want especially when there's any violence you know when they are, there's anger and and knocking down doors and things like that you just and that's when uh, you know the, sometimes another friend who called the authorities her son was in kind of a psychotic state and and she was trying to get the, the the mental health team to help get him into services instead he got sucked into criminal justice again and 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 very dramatic and you know we really as a society and this is this is not just um a substance use disorder this is mental illness I and mean, we need to figure out a way that we can um, meet people where they are this is back to harm reduction meet people where they are Offer them the services. Don't mandate or demand or push or shove because if they don't have any human rights, but but to to uh, encourage, to persuade, to engage, to uh, present alternatives. Um, you know, to, to 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 keep people alive because you you know we're we're losing so many people on the, on the streets and 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 to overdose and that um that with services and support uh 
could probably find their way to a meaningful life. Yeah. You know, I hear you say, like, I'm practicing tough love as a quote from your friend. And what, what rings true to me, and I don't know if this is true, but when someone says that, it sounds as if they're saying, and, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, I'm, I'm practicing something that I don't believe in. Yeah, yeah. And, and there, are, there are coaches that will help you to practice tough love as well. There's a, you know, all these cottage industries that are coming into addiction. Um, and, the, you know, we, do you remember the days when they, you would call somebody and they'd they, they kidnap your teenage child in the middle of the night and send them to a wilderness camp that was going to yeah. take them right? And, you know, years later, the studies are showing how detrimental that was as well, the separation of family and, and community and, um, you know, and then their adult uh, lives, they're still going to end up having the problems that they, they, they were starting to have then. It was maybe a, a problem delayed, but then exacerbated by the experience. The strength behind real, true love, right? Like, like we were talking, yes, it can, when I speak to someone from a space of love, they will never be offended. They will never be hurt because that love is, pre is preceding everything and, I am, and I'm approaching it with love. And in order to do that, you have to love yourself. Yes, that, that's a really good point. Um, it, it goes back to what I was saying in the beginning about introspection. You know, I'm willing to accept the fact that, I, that I'm a, a flawed human being, like we all are, right? I, I, for, for years, I, I tried to impart that to my, my children. It's, I don't care what mistakes you've made in your life. I've made mine, too. It's what do you do with those mistakes and how do you move past them and incorporate that, um, that lesson, that experience, into choices that you make in the future and the way that you deal with other people in the future, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. It, I, you know, a few minutes ago we were talking about uh, the powerlessness and power. Um, I, I think, and I told you I was stubborn, that I, I never like to think of myself as a victim. And I didn't want, oh, you poor mother, you, oh my goodness, and you now both of your children are in the, I didn't like that at all. I wanted to, um, to use the knowledge that, I mean, like, boy, I sure am learning a lot about the criminal justice system, I'm sure learning a lot about addiction, you know, yeah. how can I take this maybe unwanted knowledge, but nonetheless knowledge I gained, and, and use it for the better. And it's a, the old concept of, of, of taking lemons and making lemonade, right? right. But it also is, um, uh, I, do, I do not want to feel powerless. I, I want to feel my power to make change. Need change. And I want to help other parents to feel that power to make me a change. And I want people in long-term recovery to feel the power of the tremendous change that they were able to achieve and impart it to the rest of the world, right? So it, it's about building power, not accepting that I'm powerless over this and that and <laughs> <laughs> I love that because you're right because as soon as you walk into a room that is that is filled with people that have accepted that they are powerless they will not stand for you to remain powerful yeah right and and then, no no knock on AA like they, they've done really great work whatever but um we we are we are moving into a time of understanding things a little differently Right. We're moving into a time where where our own love for ourself has to precede, um, but we also have to learn how to do that because we haven't been, we haven't, we have very few signposts. A new path is one of them, to actually show us like, you are worthy, even as a you know as we want to like look at even as a parent of somebody who, mm -hmm. who is currently struggling struggling with substance abuse mm -hmm. yeah yeah 
Gretchen, thank you so much. I really appreciate your 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 just openness to talk to us about this and and really like there is so much that we we have covered and and I just keep thinking like we've we've really touched on everything and it's like the parent and the child all have to find deep true love for themselves and that will be able to extend to others. What, what, what we, uh, we fear what we don't understand, mm -hmm. right? And we hate what we fear. And this is how this kind of hard line mentality comes into place. So if you break it back down, and, and it, it's about education, it's about knowledge, it's about truth seeking at the core, right? Yeah. And then, then we can, we can, uh, we can move from there. I've always felt that our work was more about um, changing the playing field, the perception. You can't change laws and policies until you change perceptions. Right. And you can't do that unless you speak out. But like everything, you have to meet people where they are. And I'm going to give you a real quick example of that. Please. My mother was a very strict person. She would have been just great with a tough love uh, approach to things. She would but, have been like, this is my model. <laughs> <laughs> but she had three daughters who were not problem children. <laughs> well, you know, it, so, hey, it that's was, that's uh, probably why. But then when my uh, other son started having his problems and then immediately going being arrested, and, and, and she actually said, um, and my mother is not a was not a, a mean person, but and she was highly intelligent. But she said, "Well, maybe he's just the bad seed. You know, maybe this is just." Oh my God! What words to say to somebody? So I realized that she really didn't understand anything about addiction. So um, my my mother has always encouraged me to you know be better educated, use bigger words when I was younger and all that kind of stuff. I realized she loves, she loves the written work. And I had started doing a lot of writing. And so when I started writing about addiction, it, I could talk to her and she wouldn't listen. But if she read something that I had printed in a newspaper or a magazine or, or you know, or whatever, she read that and she would and she'd read and she'd say, Oh, now I understand this. And now I, I and, and, and I just have to say, by the time she died, her favorite person in the planet was my son. When he, had, when he found recovery, they developed a relationship and she got to know him. So it's, it's not impossible to change minds. It can take a long time and, and, a, and, and patience, which I'm not great at having patience as the older I get, the more I want to see things happen faster um, so I can experience the change. But, um, but, but having the respect, when, again, back to respect, to meet people where they are and to understand why they might have a, a, a hard line anti, you know, drug user mentality or um, a, to, to give them what, the patience to, to understand where they're coming from and try to meet them where they are and then grow together to a deeper right. understanding, you know. Yeah. It's, it's always... It's always a challenge communicating because you never know. It's, it's so hard to know where they are. And, mm -hmm. and it's so beautiful that, that we can learn about this and be patient and, and grow into a space of being like, now there is more information. So the more, the more we talk about it, the, we get to move the line closer. Right. We get to move the whole line closer. So now when we're meeting people where they're where they're at, they might not be as staunch to hold their line. Correct. And we're seeing that change happening all across the country now because because of the opioid overdose crisis. Um, again, now now many pathways to recovery, harm reduction services can be talked about. It's not a oh my God, they want to help her use drugs or whatever. It's yeah. not looked at that way anymore. Right. It's understood that it's something that works and it keeps people alive and 
and and and can usher them into treatment and recovery or 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 recovery without treatment it doesn't matter to me how you right you know like there's all sorts of ways to recover there's all sorts of ways to do things and um and you know i always look at the idea that like you can the only thing you can measure is someone's abstinence and that's one of the biggest problems with the, the the way the treatment centers are currently and 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 how parents are encouraged to test their children and other things like that instead of oh you know he's rebuilding relationships he's got a job he's doing you know uh, that's what our measure of success should be I, so right. I, yeah and and they used that for years uh, uh, the healthcare industry that oh I have a hundred percent success rate. For how long? I mean, they're not following them a year later, so that right. I don't know as they long as we out. stop following them, we still have our percentage, right? And yeah. then we can keep getting those same people in and out the door, so that mm -hmm. we can keep getting that insurance money mm -hmm. or parents' money, and and that's the you know healthcare industrial complex that you mentioned yeah. earlier. Yeah, and and it's a it's vicious. Yeah, unfortunately, we still have a long way to go. That's right. right. And, and, and we're here going. Yes. So, yeah. and I'm, and, and, and I ain't tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can get tired, but I, but when, when my son's down long to recovery, uh, a friend said, why are you still doing this? You know, you, you, Hey, you, your, your kids are okay. And I said, yes, not all kids are okay. And there's still so much to do. So, yeah. so many, um, uh, non facts to debunk and uh, and perceptions to change and, and 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 until we have a system of treatment on demand and um, and you know respect for all pathways to recovery and I do love your reco recovery towards instead of from yeah. um, and that goes so that that marries so well with with the true love not tough love idea that you have to have something to return to right yeah. you have to have an open door and um when you when you find your way yeah and even you know like even if you're not the one like recovering from like to have to make sure that you have an open door for those who are out there like mm -hmm. like it's not going to be easy but it's it's not it, it's not happening to you, you know, like this is just your life now and, and, and understanding that there are things I cannot change, mm -hmm. but I can change how, you know, like how I bring it in. I can change how I present myself in terms of like what that looks like. And I can change how things progress from here. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Gretchen, you are awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so glad we met in this serendipitous way. It was it was really quite extraordinary. So yeah, I I I am floored by it. It's a story I tell often. Um, your name has like everybody knows who you are in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so Thanks. so it should uh, it, it if that pleases you. <laughs> it, does, it does very much so. Thank well, you. thank you so much, and I and uh, I am. I'm looking forward to continue staying connected and um, to, you know, do more together somehow. Yes. You can find links where you can connect with Gretchen and a new path in the description of this episode. Please rate and review this podcast and or leave comments for this episode to help me better create helpful content. Support this show at Anchor.fm or support me and my work at Patreon where you will get access to unedited content as well as writings and access to supporter group portrait sessions with me. I host workshops regularly, which are both open to the public and are a source of continuing education units for professionals. I also take a limited number of one-on-one -on -one clients every month, so contact me when you're ready to work together through martinjohn.com. I also accept financial support through Venmo at martinjohn underscore Garcia, so if you benefit from this content, please consider supporting my efforts. If you're in Chicago, you can work with me in person at Satnam Yoga Chicago, but if not, you can connect with me on the Wisdom app for both content and mentorship. Thank you for listening to the Recover Yourself podcast, and until next time, keep recovering yourself. <laughs>